Ron Suskine is on the line with us. He he is the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author of a number of books. His most recent, Confidence Men, Wall Street, Washington, and the Education of a President. His website, Ron Suskind, S-U-S-K-I-N-D dot com. Ron, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. How are you, Tom? Uh, I'm fine, and thank you for joining us. Um, I, I'm curious from your book has been widely covered, I think, and, and I think a lot of people are very familiar with the, the the more obvious questions, although some of them are probably worth revisiting. But the one thing that I haven't heard, or maybe I've just missed, and it's probably calling more for opinion on your part, is if just to set this up, you you, you wrote this book, you interviewed the president, you interviewed all these people around him. Um, if he, you know, he's been changing his tune a lot lately with regard to uh, becoming far more populist. If he's reelected, will we see a different, you know, you talk about team A and team B in the, in the book, basically, yeah. you know, will we see a change in economic advisory teams and a fundamental change in an economic approach? Are we going to see him become more like FDR or in your opinion, is what we're seeing right now, this populist rhetoric, just the stuff that has to be done to get reelected? You know, it's, it's the, that's the $64,000 question, Tom. You know, is this just a political convenience, him now being more activist, more populist, or is he, does he actually uh, uh, believe now that uh, he missed his big opportunity, as I talk about in early uh, uh, 2009, he's there a few months, he could have restructured Wall Street. Frankly, Democrats and Republicans both wanted him to do it. Look, the Tea Party, uh, you know, was, was at that point, uh, uh, you know, the energy that created it was rising up, uh, you know, can he get that back now? Uh, he may have lost his historical moment, at least short of another crisis, uh, providing it again. And the question now is, is, uh, is this just a sound and fury signifying very little uh, other than uh, how do I get reelected or has he changed? My sense from our conversations was that um, uh, if I had to bet, I would say he uh, feels a lot of regret about not being Roosevelt when he had the shot. If he gets a shot again, I think he will try to be. And if he gets reelected, I think that'll be a, uh, something that uh, will be uh, right uh, first off the tarmac. In fact, it seems to me, given the times, he almost has no choice. That The parade has yeah, gotten so way, big, he's got to get out in front of it. You're right in the money. You're right in the money. I mean, look, the, the fact is is that it's, it's in a way, uh, a matter now of increasing national mandate. And that's what's interesting. You talk about the Occupy Wall Street movement. You talk about the Tea Party. The energy creating both these things, as, as I think you've pointed out, Tom, is, you know, very similar. It's coming from the same American landscape yep. where people are troubled. And they kind of get it now. It, it took a little while to say, you know, this financial capital of New York and that financial system is not working on behalf of either American business or Main Street. Uh, they are sort of members of some wider global economy, and in fact, they're they're advancing, accelerating, and exacerbating many of the things that have troubled and burdened America in this period. You know, it's, a, Obama, it's populist rage. Basically. You know, some Republicans said, "Look, if he had done it in so, the spring of 2009, we would be facing a very strong president now that none of us on the Republican side could beat." He didn't do it, and he may not get reelected because of it. Right, and and in fact, probably he wouldn't have lost Congress in 20. 10 either but you know I, that's that's all in the so. past and, and in fact speaking of the past and and juxtaposing it with the present if you don't mind my going back to another yeah. one of your books you wrote way of the world right yeah of course yeah okay i just you know i, I i'm yeah. pulling Wait this one in three books on the bush era yeah yeah i'm pulling i'm pulling this one entirely out of memory so correct me if i have anything wrong on this but my uh, you know uh, Muammar Gaddafi was uh, today confirmed to be dead and we're yeah. seeing this this incredible destabilization of the middle east um, yeah. that it seems there were kind of two origins to the first being Bush's invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, and the second mm -hmm. arguably being uh, President Obama going over to Egypt and standing there on the platform, you know, next to the dictator and saying to the people, you shouldn't have to put up with dictators. And yeah. I credit that as being one of the sparks of the Arab Spring. You point out in, in Way of the World, if and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, how yeah. Bush destabilized the Middle East, basically based on lies, and how Condi Rice was trying to protect Benazir Bhutto, who could have been a real change agent in Pakistan and protect her from assassination. And Dick Cheney shot that down. You know, no U.S. protection services, no U.S. whatever to help Benazir Bhutto. And, of course, she got assassinated. 
Um, a, is that right? And B, do yeah. you see a tie-in between those events and what's happening now? And if so, what is it? Well, it's it's interesting. You know, Budo, I I think I, I do the last interview of a major journalist, certainly, with Budo, just uh, 10 days before she dies. I'm in Quetta, which is the troubled city in the western part of Pakistan. And, and Budo, you know, uh, basically opens up and she says, why won't they protect me? Dick Cheney uh, clearly has abandoned me. Uh, Khan, the others said, uh, you know, look, I've grown. You know, Budo, is, you know, she's no choir girl. You know, she's corrupt down to her socks, but she understood the power of democracy in that part of the world and became its vessel. And, and ultimately, Cheney's view was that we would rather work with a dictator, Musharraf, uh, than with these sort of uncontrollable issues of democratic growth and self-determination of peoples in that region. Uh, that was the Bush way. And ultimately, I think uh, Obama, certainly that Cairo speech, which was just extraordinary, and it's in my book, in the current book. Mm -hmm. You know, o Obama has set a new tone. The question is, will it express itself in policies, uh, in strategies uh, that allow forward motion, as opposed to destabilization that maybe could turn in the wrong direction? And, and again, that's part of this problem that this administration has had, certainly domestically more, but even in foreign affairs, uh, in terms of uh, best uh, ideas and then real execution, in terms of follow-through, in terms of getting to where they need to be. Um, and right now it's a very volatile situation over there. And, yeah. uh, it's one though, <laughs> that creates opportunity, obviously, and, and, and opportunity is, is hopefully what we expect our leaders to seize upon. Well, there's, there's this famous concept. I'm forgetting the guy who, who came up with the na name of it. It was back, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, the, the J-curve, that when a, when a country, a non-democratic country, is overthrown or collapses or has a coup or whatever it may be in, in a, and starts moving in a more democratic direction. It goes from a point of stability, like a J on its side. Okay. At the bottom That's of the J, right. it goes in rapidly downward in terms of stability. And then it, it hits some point where it goes in one of two directions. Either it goes into autocracy and becomes stable again, or it slides up the J and into democracy and becomes stable again. But in either case, stability returns and we're watching that played out in the Middle East, and to some extent, that's being influenced by our policies in the Middle East. I'm curious your thoughts on how President Obama and the people in his administration are dealing with that in the minute we have left here, uh, Ron Suscon. Yeah, very, very quick comment from a, from a key Washington uh, handler. It says, Obama creates a space, is what he said at the beginning of his presidency, he creates a space where solutions can happen by his presence, by his openness, by the whole Obama aura. That's what he does at the start. He's done that some ways in the world. The problem is, is Obama has not figured out a way to own that space he's created. Other people have jumped in, all sorts of, of complications and devils in the mix. And Obama still struggles with owning the space, the space that he has created, both domestically and internationally. And he needs to own that space now when it comes to building these democracies. He needs to engage. He can't just let events unfold, as he's done in most domestic policies, uh, and say, I'll get to it later once it sort of coalesces. That doesn't work in foreign affairs. Do you see affairs. him moving in that direction? I think that's the real question. Do you see him moving in that direction? Of owning that space? I don't know. I don't see much evidence of it on some of the foreign terrain. Uh, domestically, obviously, the book is about Obama defaulting on many of these issues of leadership. And Frank was being bought by both the left and the right because it's the first real glimpse we're going to get, and maybe we'll get before the election, yeah. as to what's really gone on in terms of this country and how it's been led. Uh, you know, obviously, I did do an awful lot to dig up these disclosures. They're all you, taped interviews. You did, and then you will meet these characters as though you've never met it's, some it's of them. It's brilliant. It's a, it's a brilliant book. Confidence Men, Wall Street, Washington, and the Education of a President. Ron Suskind. Thank you, Ron.